And when there's a black NRA member that's shot by the cops like Philando Castile in Minneapolis a couple years ago, the Republicans stay silent. They all scurry away into Mitch McConnell's turtle shell and hide there until everything blows <laughs> <Yeah>. up. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the eyes. That's, that's, that's amazing. That's spot on. <laughs> no, there's so much. No. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Hey, a quick note, what you're about to see uh, throughout this video is from the live virtual comedy shows I'm doing called the Citizen Revolution Comedy Show. So throughout these episodes, you guys are going to hear some people laughing in the background and that's because it is recorded in front of a live virtual audience uh, in, a, in, in the Zoom showroom so to speak. And if you want to be a part of this, if you want to be a part of these live virtual events, you can grab tickets for future shows right now. They're happening every single Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. So you can grab your tickets, go to the, go to the description, check out the link for these shows, come join us. Uh, and I'm going to be donating a portion of the ticket sales to various different grassroots organizations, activists, journalists, and small business venues. Uh, every single week it'll be different material. Every single week it'll be a different um, organization or venue that I will be helping out. So that's, uh, that's something that you can, you can be a part of if you choose so. So grab your tickets. Now on to the episode. Before we get into this week's episode, I just want to let you guys know that content like this is often suppressed. So uh, I need your help to make sure that people see this video uh, so make sure you hit the subscribe button make sure you hit the like button if you enjoy this stuff and if you want to support uh, this show and and all of the the content that I produce uh, on a weekly basis you can become a sustaining member over on my website at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate you can become a sustaining member directly on my website or via patreon and you get a bunch of uh, cool stuff. You get early access to longer full episodes of Forkful of Noodles. You get uh, unreleased uh, stand-up comedy and storytelling stuff. You get free tickets to virtual and live stand-up comedy shows. Uh, so go to ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate uh, and consider becoming a sustaining member or making a one-time donation. Now on to the episode. So in today's society, when you hear the words Black Panther, it usually evokes a 20-something crossing their arms and screaming, Wakanda forever! <laughs> <laughs> but if you mention Huey Newton, Fred Hampton, Bobby Seal to these people, they just stare at you and say, they don't really remember who the actor that played the Blank Panther was, but he was very good and he definitely deserves an Oscar. But what those names should evoke are the words revolution, organizers, and progress. And look, as much as I love those Marvel movies, I gotta say, they haven't particularly captured the spirit of the Black Panther, even in the comic books. Hell, the second issue had him fighting the Ku Klux Klan after the board, <laughs> yeah, it's true. The board at Marvel requested there be more white characters introduced into the books. <laughs> Uh, that's that's uh, 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 <laughs> yeah they, they were they got quiet real fucking quick uh, the real black panthers came out of a need for social revolution in america in the 60s and that need is still here today so it's important to know what they did right where they dropped the ball and how and why they were attacked by the establishment while driving social change and paradigm shifts Aside from the comic book character, the only thing we really know about these gr this group is that they were militant black men out for black freedoms with guns and leather and sunglasses <laughs> and <brain. laughs> All of which were black. <laughs> 
Three pictures yeah. of me. <laughs> if you don't know, the Black Panthers were created by Bobby Seale and Huey Newton in 1965 after the assassination of Malcolm X. At this point, there were riots over police brutality in predominantly black neighborhoods. And this was also a time when protesters were having dogs sicked on them and marchers were being hosed down. And this is how you know that teaching racism has gotten out of hand when dogs are trained to be racist. No. Oh. Right? Dogs have no interest in judging people based on melanin contest, content, right? They only have interest in belly rubs and who's got the treats. Well, aren't we all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Look, I feel like teaching dogs to be racist goes against the Eighth Amendment of cruel and unusual punishment. Emphasis on unusual. <laughs> Listen, you got to be real weird to try to teach a dog the N-word. <laughs> also racist. You have to be very, very racist. <laughs> It's the same thing with horse cops, right? Those, those horses don't want to be an instrument of oppression. They want to be <laughs> free. You know, eating apples from the hands of horse whispers. Not, <laughs> not having oh. commands shouted at them by Sergeant Pepper Spray. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> 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 I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, every time I see a horse at a protest, I have to wonder if these horses are thinking, this is bullshit. Now, my life matters too, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm, I'm not just here to let you bear mace innocent people. You know, I really have to wonder how many horses put their two weeks notice in after a protest against police brutality. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, sweet. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is only the intro. <laughs> <laughs> now, Huey Newton was a law student that knew how to protect himself in the streets, right? Newton introduced the idea of how militarized the police are by saying they occupy black neighborhoods as troops occupying a territory. Really, this is taking Manifest Destiny a bit too far, isn't it? <laughs> the cops are no longer protecting and serving. They're all about manifesting and destinying. <laughs> now... If you are unfamiliar, uh, so so where's the lie? Right. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Manifest Destiny, that's the idea that all of the land was destined to be America's, and if you pray hard enough, or rather, more accurately, if you pillage hard enough, hmm. they take their land theirs, which would then fulfill their destinies. You know. It's a, it's a real pull yourself up by your bootstraps approach to oppression. <laughs> I'd really appreciate that effort. Now, right now, America has 1,000 military bases around the globe, which just means that Manifest Destiny has been franchised like a Subway or a McDonald's. No. Yeah. For every base that occupies it, your territory, you get one free toy that says upward mobility. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray, freedom via merchandise depression. Hey. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> right? Look, I just think Manifest Destiny is an incredibly juvenile philosophy, right? It's basically the called it a foreign policy. <laughs> I hear, misheard. The what? The called it, you know? The, like when you're just like, hey, what is that? Guam called it. America calling it right there. <laughs> yep. is, that, is that Korea called it first? America nailing it, called it. It's ours. We called it. That's ours. That's, mm -hmm. 
it's manifest destiny in a nutshell. I licked it first. Uh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Somebody has siblings. <laughs> now, Bobby Seale was a genius organizer. And he was also a natural born rapper, but instead of starting a band like most college kids do, he came up with the Panther tagline and really what became their mission, power to the people, power to all the people. And just within that statement alone, the myth of black nationalism and militancy is dissolved. The Black Panthers believed that society's issues were coming from a systemic level, specifically poverty, which has affected people of all races and creeds. Now, if this sounds familiar, it's because a lot of progressives and anti-establishment activists, organizers, commentators, and comedians are still saying this stuff today. <laughs> Guys, the Black Panthers pointed this out in 1966. That's 54 years ago. What is the time limit on trying ideas that don't work and finally, finally listening to the voice of the people? Is it like 55 years? <laughs> now, Newton also said, uh, we're here to transform society and erect a system where people will receive justice. So in order to specify what they meant, they came up with their 10-point program, which in reality was just addressing basic human rights. And I'll cover them more, uh, a little bit more in depth in just a, just a few minutes here. But one of the aspects of the 10 point plan was to end police brutality of black people in America. Now, after the cops murdered another young black kid, which was basically the discriminatory cherry on the Jim Crow cake, which if you're wondering, is just a big pile of flour. Because it's all white, because the flower ah. is all white. Yeah. <laughs> Some of these jokes are going to be very subtle. Uh, <laughs> but after, the, after the, the, the murder of yet another young black kid at the hands of the cops, the Panthers decided to start their first initiative called Cop Watch. With Huey Newton being a law student, he knew that California Penal Code 12020 to 12027 states that people were allowed to observe the police from a safe distance. And the Second Amendment granted them the right to bear arm during these observations. And if the police decided to shoot them, they had a right to defend themselves. So here is what Huey had to say. The uh, California Penal Code section 1220 through 12027 and also the Second Amendment of the Constitution guarantees the citizen a right to bear arms on public property. Huey said we're going to carry our guns and we're going to follow the police. And if they stop someone, we're going to stop. We're going to maintain a legal distance and we're going to observe these so-called officers in the performance of their duty. Now, of course, this irritated the police officers, which then prompted Republicans to say that they needed tighter restrictions on gun laws. That's right, folks. Republicans <laughs> against guns. <laughs> now, <laughs> it's hard to believe. Look, I try not to make all of the issues about race, right? But this one is just a little bit too obvious. All of a sudden, a bunch of black guys with guns show up to ensure that a mustachioed cop wasn't going to kill another innocent civilians, and the Republicans want to pretend like the Second Amend Amendment doesn't exist. Now, had this been a white dude mm. with a sawed-off shotgun and a water bottle full of chew, the cops might have deputized him for a week. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> now, in today's society, we do have a version of cop watch it's using our cell phones and going live on social media and of course unleashing the wrath of our karens threatening to contact a manager <laughs> ah. that's right we're using karens for good you guys we're we're about to exercise our constitutional oh. right to speak 100 oh of the managers <laughs> bring them on 
<laughs> right? Plus, we have the Black Lives Matter movement that is keeping violent and unjust cops at bay with protests and demonstrations for every innocent person killed by the police. <laughs> now, in today's society, there aren't really Republicans advocating for tighter restrictions on guns, right? And they're, rather, they're, they're kind of flooding the market with them. Freedom! But in order to get that, you have to duel your neighbors. <laughs> Just go ahead and take 10 paces. That's one for every <laughs> amendment you don't understand. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and when there's a black NRA member that's shot by the cops like Philando Castile in Minneapolis a couple years ago, the Republicans stay silent. They all scurry away into Mitch McConnell's turtle shell and hide there until everything blows <laughs> up. <laughs> Look at the eyes. That's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. That's spot on. <laughs> they only peek out when they need to blame the mentally ill or Muslims. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in 1967, the Republicans decided they need to restrict open carry, right? And the Black Panthers decided that uh, to protest that ruling. Uh, and Bobby Seale took 30 Panthers down to the California State House, brandished with rifles, handguns, shotguns. And this was happening at the same time that Governor Ronald Reagan was talking to the future leaders of America. You know, these people, they're the ones that keep trying to tell you that they're legislating on your behalf by telling you that corporations will trickle everything down. Yeah, and of course, the media freaked out thinking the Panthers were some kind of a gun club. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense calls upon the American people in general and the black people in particular to take careful note of the racist California legislature, which is now considering legislation aimed at keeping the black people disarmed and powerless at the very same time racist police agencies throughout the country are intensifying the terror, brutality, murder, and repression of black people. That was Bobby Seale, by the way. Uh... Now, here's the thing. They eventually made it to the California Senate to talk about why passing the bill was a bad idea and what they stood for, as you just saw. And Bobby Seal, that, that was Bobby Seal addressing the media and outlining their 10-point program for human rights, right? After all that, the Panthers went to a gas station about a mile away where the cops confiscated all of their guns and charged them under conspiracy and arrested all of them. And that includes Bobby Seal. Yet, we really haven't arrested any of the corporate media for spreading McCarthy's conspiracy for the last four years. And neither have we arrested my neighbor who keeps saying that our landlady is a mole person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? I'm sorry, Andy. She's, it's, it's not true. She just doesn't want to have dinner with you. It's a different thing. It's a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, Congressman yeah, right. Kishaw, the Congressman it's Kishaw, it's Chris's fault. <laughs> now, uh, a Congressman did come out and uh, they passed the bill, um, and they said that they were scared and out of fear that this Panther bill had to be passed in 1967. Now, Ronald Reagan is quoted to say, I don't think loaded guns is a way to solve a problem that should be solved among people of goodwill. Anyone oh. who would approve of this demonstration is out of their mind. That's a direct quote from, from the old Gipper himself. <laughs> now- Oh, fuck that guy. <laughs> yeah, according to this logic though, <laughs> The cops that have killed innocent unarmed people, whether they were black or otherwise, according to God King Reagan, are clinically insane. Right? Op open up the loot against people. God King Reagan. Oh my god, I'm embarrassed. We got we got some cops to check into these loony bins, guys. You know? Look, apparently the thin blue line is a psychological diagnosis, which 
Which begs the question, does that mean <laughs> an asshole is a pre-existing condition for cops? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very important question, I think. Oh, oops, went a little too ahead. Uh, sorry about that. But here's a, here's a real question for Republicans, right? Um, when you think of the gold standard of Republican, what do you think they would say about the AR-15? And how deep the dick of the NRA is down the throat of the party today? You know? <laughs> do you think the Gipper would call you crazy? You know? And now look, before everybody freaks out and says I'm sexist for making it a dick and not a lady part, there is a reason. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to hear okay. this. <laughs> <laughs> look, most Republicans are homophobic as well as racist. Okay, I'm just trying to make them gag both physically and mentally at the sight of their guns. <laughs> oh, 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 hell yeah. Right? So this is like a really progressive joke, you guys. <laughs> Now, here's the thing. Eventually, in a shootout, Officer John Fry is killed, and Huey Newton is blamed for it. Newton gets put into prison, so now both party leaders are behind bars. So this brought in Eldridge Cleaver, who's the third person on the screen, right? Uh, Eldridge Cleaver was an intellectual that had credibility with both the white and the black communities. Uh, Cleaver was a little bit more bombastic than Newton and Seal. Right? He even said that he beat Ronald Reagan with a marshmallow in a duel. I say that Ronald Reagan is a punk, a fifty, and a coward. And I challenge you to a duel. I challenge you. I challenge him to a duel to the death or until he says Uncle Elvis. Hey. And I give him his choice of weapons. He could use a gun, a knife, a baseball bat, or a marshmallow, and I'll beat him to death with the marshmallow. <laughs> That's how I feel about him. <laughs> That's a real thing that happened, you guys. <laughs> a black man threatened to attack a governor and beat him to death with a marshmallow. <laughs> That's a part of American history. <laughs> what a country, right? <laughs> So look, as things kept escalating with the cops, the Panthers came up with one of their most iconic sayings, uh, sayings uh, uh, and illustrations that went in their newspapers. <laughs> their cartoons drawn by Emery Douglas read, fuck the pigs. And the cops said that their feelings were hurt when the kids would yell it at them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real thing. <laughs> when it was picked up by college students, them saying it, that definitely bothers. I was a sergeant patrolling in the project, and there was a cutest little girl. So I stopped to say hello, and I said, Hi, honey, how are you doing today? And she looked at me and she said, Fuck you, pig. And I thought, we have lost it, and we have lost it. She was raised right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, the cops make all these speeches and stuff and they talk about how, you know, it was, uh, it was detrimental to hear these college students and these little girls say, fuck the pigs, you know. But, but, but the minority community's feelings are shattered when you murder one of us in cold blood. They don't really have anything to say about that, do we? But here we are, rising up constantly from all of that pain. So maybe your bourgeoisie boot-licking snowflake ass can take a few jokes thrown in your direction, Officer Bacon. Oink, oink, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> or, or I think this is a better idea, is maybe you could just stop killing us in the interest of rich people. You know, and maybe serve the community you're actually supposed to serve. Do what your badge actually fucking says. And you could do that instead. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, things kept escalating, right? 
There was a lot of back and forth struggle. And things started to dissolve. And this, this back and forth is, is really what started to dissolve the Black Panther Party for self-defense. In 1968, after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., the violence from the Black Panther Party escalated and led to, to the death of the very first Panther, little Bobby Hutton. Now, before we get to that, the death of Dr. King meant that hope for unity had died with him. There was a lot of anger within the black community, in and out of the Black Panthers, for the man that walked through hells to befriend the oppressor to gain equality. And then he was killed for it. And that anger that they felt was absolutely righteous. Eldridge Cleaver wanted to make a point and decided the party needed to take decisive action and take arms against the police. Now, the elder members knew that this was not a risk that they wanted to take, but the younger members were ready to action. So 17-year-old Bobby Hutton borrowed a shotgun and went out with Cleaver to hunt for cops. Eventually, they did get into a shootout. They got trapped in a basement after the cops had fired tear gas into the house they were in. Uh, and the house was going to burn, and Cleaver suggested that they surrender. But in order to make sure that they wouldn't get shot, they needed to go out naked to prove that they were unarmed. Now, Hutton was 17, and he was shy, so he only took off his shirt. The cops killed him. This is the origins of Hands Up, Don't Shoot. And it's a continuing pattern of innocent Black kids getting killed by a system protecting its investments first. Also, pants can be very scary. <laughs> you know, according to the cops, you never know if it's just a roll of quarters, you know, or is somebody excited to see them, or if it's a bazooka. <laughs> now, after this uh, incident, Cleaver had disappeared. He later reappeared in Algeria to start the international wing of the Black Panther Party. When Nixon came into power, the Nixon administration was calling for law and order to be returned to the streets. And so go back to the root cause of the problem, creating an overpowered law and order system that oppresses citizens of color that only makes them want to push back. And with both sides escalating actions and tensions, it got a lot of people killed. And it kept a lot of people in prison to this day. One of these escalations included the creation of the Black Liberation Army, which was the militant wing of the Black Panther Party instituted in 1971. So here is uh, one of the people that currently is still in prison. Let's run with that. So one of the cases that, was, uh, that has been brought to light over the last few years is the cases, a case of Jalil Muntakim, who was accused of killing two cops in 1971. Muntakim has been in prison for close to 50 years now, despite evidence showing that he didn't fire the gun that killed the two officers uh, in question. And the reason be that he's being denied parole is because he doesn't regret being a Black Panther and a revolutionary. In 2002, he did say that he regrets the death of these two cops, but he doesn't regret being a Black Panther. Now, this makes him a political prisoner, and this is the treatment that most of the Black Panthers in prison get, too. This is an unconstitutional imprisonment. And it's 2020. It's no longer illegal to be a member of the LGBTQ community. Fuck, it's not even illegal to be a neo-Nazi or a white nationalist. Fuck, you, can, you are still allowed to be a member of the McDonald's Happy Meal Club at age 43. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's getting personal. Yeah, well, you know, you got to keep collecting the toys. Right? <laughs> but if you're a Black Panther that stood up for the people's right, they're going to go ahead and keep you in prison, which continues to prove the point of what we're all fighting for. There, there are those that don't have any sympathy for political prisoners like Munta Kim. In fact, in 2018, it was stated in a press conference that no cop killers should walk the face of the earth. Talking about the parole, the possible parole of cop killers. And yes, they're guilty then and they're guilty now. 
and no cop killer should ever walk the face of the earth. But we let killer cops walk all over our society every single day and the laws don't do anything about that. In fact, most times cops are protected after they take the life of a innocent child, especially if that child was black, like Bobby Hutton. Now this is the wife of one of the deceased cops and she's made statements like, uh, if you kill someone that's meant to protect society, then you deserve the death penalty. Look, statements like this are made out of pain and the torment of loss and they fail to see the other side of the argument. Cop watch was put into place because there was no protection from law enforcement, especially if you were black or brown. The police were not there to serve the communities of color, but rather contain them, as Huey Newton has put it. And in this country that has a torrid history of containing people against their will, perhaps it's time to treat people a little bit better. And through pain and loss, unfortunately, this woman said some unfortunately racist things. There are right now over 19 black radicals that believe in Panther philosophy still in prison today. One of the oldest of these folks is Chip Fitzgerald, who is 80 years old. This is how fragile our criminal justice system is, that it fears an elderly black man that could be returned into society. How feeble is a criminal justice system with its chains of institutionalized racism that it clearly says that it's weaker than an 80 year old man who should be soaking up the sun in Fort Lauderdale and getting SDIs in his retirement community. <laughs> okay, I lost my script, okay. Here's the thing. The Panthers legacy written by the oligarchs with their media propaganda proxies became about violence in the streets. But that's not really what the Panthers ever stood for, right? Cop watch and the escalation of violence came from one side not listening to the needs of the other. One side not feeling protected or served. And when you turn civic duty into military force, you should expect some pushback. The Second Amendment granted the, the, the citizens of this country to form a well-regulated militia and they misused the shit out of some commas. <laughs> the Black Panther Party at least got one of those things right. I don't know about their comma use, but they were a well-regulated and well-organized revolutionaries that fought intellectually and physically against an unjust system while advocating for some of the most best and progressive ideas we've ever seen in the 20th and 21st century. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode. If you guys enjoyed this content, please make sure that you hit the like button and the share button. Get this out there to as many people as you can. Send it out to some friends. Send it out to some enemies. Send it out. Put it, put it in some groups. Um, content like this is often suppressed and it is up to, uh, I depend on you guys to share this stuff out and like this stuff to make sure that it's shown to new people um, and new people learn about this channel. And if you haven't, uh, please hit the subscribe button uh, to make sure that you are getting notifications when we put videos up. I'm going to be putting videos up every single week on this channel, content like this, uh, more, more scripted uh, comedy content. There will be some rantier content, some audio content, some interview stuff uh, coming up as well. Um, these, what you're seeing in these videos is from the Citizen Revolution live virtual comedy shows uh so if you are a a a fan of uh this this sort of stuff and you want to see it live uh in a virtual setting of course um please uh, get tickets for these shows um what I'm doing with these shows is 50% uh, of the ticket sales is going to a grassroots organization, uh, activists, uh, journalists, venues across the country, people that really need help uh, that aren't being helped by, uh, by, by the federal government right now. So, so it's up to us to help each other out. And this is, this is me doing my part. Uh, so since I talk about these larger ideas, these socially conscious topics, uh, in my comedy, I figured I should, um, I, I wanted to donate to, uh, to groups that stand for these, these causes and issues and ideas that I uh, talk about often, uh, especially on this channel. This particular show, 
Uh, I donated 100% of the ticket sales to the Black Visions Collective in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They are a uh, POC queer driven community based uh, organizers that are helping out protesters that have uh, been wrongfully arrested for the act of protesting. So I donated 100% of the ticket sales to that. So if, if you're watching this video, you weren't able to make it to the to live stand up comedy show where we discuss the Black Panthers and you want to donate to the Black Vision Collective, the links are in the description below. So please check out the links, uh, the ticket links and the donation links and um, make sure that you share. Um, like I said, the, the Citizen Revolution comedy shows, they happen every Friday at 9 p.m. If you want to, you can, um, you can, you can check out all of the dates uh, on my website at ramannoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N noodlescomedy.com. Uh, as a, a full-time touring performer, that has basically lost a majority of, uh, of my work. Uh, being a touring performer, uh, these virtual comedy shows, sustaining memberships and album sales are pretty much how I'm going to be earning my living right now. And it's also a way that I can um, continue to help, uh, like I said, grassroots organizations, activists, journalists, and small business venues that I've worked with across the country uh, that are um, that are, that are kind of struggling right now. So uh, yeah, so if you want to uh, check out the links in the description, but make sure you hit that subscribe, make sure you hit that share button, make sure you hit that like button and get the word out. Uh, you can follow me on a bunch of social media stuff at Krish Mohan Ha Ha and stay tuned for more videos because we are going to be uh, putting up weekly videos on this channel uh, discussing big topics like this, discussing topics that you don't normally see on, uh, on any sort of mainstream media or uh, any sort of mainstream comedy channels. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Until next week, see